Hello, beautiful best friends, and welcome to part dos of our deep dive into the McDonald family murders. Have you come to say hi already? Hello. Yeah, they come back again. They came back to see you again. If you've randomly stumbled across this video and you haven't seen part one yet, then you can click somewhere up here to see it. And if you have seen part one, then you already know that my name is Liz and that you and me are best friends forever. And you'll be aware it's not just you and me here today. We are of course joined by Lily as usual. So editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cam. Um, Lily? Hey. I'm pretty sure that's the quickest in drive ever gotten done before. So you're welcome. And the reason for the quick intro is because I still have so much to tell you guys about this case. Like remember in part one where I was like, I don't know if it's going to be a two-parter or a three-parter. Well, it's definitely a three-parter guys. And I don't know why I even questioned that in the first place. So in the last video, I promised you guys that we will be talking some more about Helena Stokely, the young teenager that thought that she might've been present in the McDonald apartment when the murders were taking place. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time in the second half of this video talking about whether Helena was there or not. But to pick up where we left off, Jeffrey McDonald had just been found not guilty of murdering his family, Colette Kimberly and Kristen. And this was despite just a whole mess of evidence at the crime scene, pointing the finger directly at Jeffrey as being the one that had committed these murders. So it seemed like this should have been a slam dunk for the prosecution, but in reality, it was anything but. So at the Article 32 hearing in 1970, Jeffrey was represented by this really fancy lawyer that his mother had hired for him named Bernard Siegel, who was originally from Philadelphia. And Siegel stood out from your average lawyer for both his interesting appearance and the quite theatrical method he employed to defend his clients. And Siegel quickly realized that he had a pretty easy gig at this hearing. Like his case was almost handed to him on a golden platter because as it turned out, the investigation into the murders had been so severely flawed from the very beginning. And all Siegel had to do to win this case for Jeffrey was point out all of the different ways that the CID had messed up. So we're now going to go through the like original crime scene investigation and go through all of the different ways that this investigation was flawed. We're going to start at the very beginning when the first MPs arrived on the scene at about 3.45 a.m. on the 17th of February. According to Kenneth Micah, who we mentioned in part one as having seen that woman randomly standing in the rain on a corner in the middle of the night on his way to the crime scene, he said that there were just way too many MPs on the scene that night. We're talking 26 or 27 MPs in that little tiny apartment. And these MPs, might I mention, were much more used to breaking up drunken fights between soldiers at the bar, not the massacre that they had walked into. So they were rattled, they were inexperienced and just bustling around, not really having the first clue as to what they were supposed to be doing, but impatient to get this show on the road. So things were already off to a bad start when Jeffrey's wallet was stolen off a desk in the living room by one of the ambulance drivers. But as the hours went on and news started to spread about what had happened, not only were there more MPs arriving on the scene, not really to help, but to just have a good old nosy around, but allegedly neighbors and other members of the general public were also allowed to just go into the apartment and have a look around. So it should be of no real surprise to anyone with the unprofessional way this crime scene was handled that extremely important pieces of evidence were being lost, destroyed and contaminated. Just going by the crime scene photos, a lot of things in the apartment were touched, moved around, totally destroying the integrity of the scene. For instance, the flower pot that had been knocked over was put upright, probably by the same MP that Micah had to tell of for sitting on the couch. And not only was one of the phones off the hook in one photo and in place in the cradle in another, but one of the MPs had wiped blood and potentially 
any fingerprints off the phone so that they could make a phone call. There were MPs in the kitchen using the kettle to make themselves coffee. The trash was allowed to be carted away without checking it for any evidence. A supposed piece of skin that had been found under Colette's fingernail was just lost. And then there were the fingerprints. Whoever had tried to lift the majority of them had forgotten to put resin down under the tape. So when the tape was lifted, the fingerprints were also just lost. And these fingerprints were in very important places, like in the master bedroom and the kitchen, like they were make or break when it came to proving whether other people had been in the apartment that night, like Jeffrey said there had been. But apparently it wouldn't have mattered anyway, because Kimberly and Kristen's fingerprints were never taken for comparison. Also, while in the reenactments that the CID did of the struggle in the living room, where the coffee table always landed on its top rather than on its side as it was found, something they pointed at and said was proof that Jeffrey had staged the crime scene. The defense pointed out that in their reenactments of the struggle in the living room, the table absolutely could land on its side as it was found if its momentum was interrupted by hitting the arm of the chair next to it. And considering how many things had been moved around in the apartment during the crime scene investigation, it was absolutely plausible that the chair was one of these things that had been moved. I could go on, there is more, but I think you guys are getting a pretty good general mental picture of how the crime scene was being treated and how poorly everything was being carried out. Like it was ridiculous. It was pretty ridiculous, wasn't it? I think you could have done a better job. Just to make matters worse, at the hospital, Jeffrey's pajama bottoms were thrown out by an orderly because he saw that they were stained with blood. I mean, I guess that's not entirely the CID's fault, but multiple medics that worked on Jeffrey when he arrived at the hospital said that they saw these pajama bottoms and that they were torn through the leg seams of the crotch area. Now there's a high chance that these pajama bottoms were made from the same material as Jeffrey's pajama top. And if they were ripped like these medics claimed, then who's to say that all of those blue fibers that we mentioned in part one weren't from the bottoms rather than the top? This now offered a pretty innocent explanation as to why the fibers were found where they were, like in the girls' beds. Moving on back to the Article 32, multiple people testified about the amazing husband and father and doctor that they knew Jeffrey to be, that he was always doting on the girls, always playing with them, always very considerate and loving towards Colette, and always managed to keep his calm in very stressful situations at work. And he worked in the emergency room. Room. So he was very often in stressful situations. So this flimsy idea that the prosecution were pushing that Jeffrey had just randomly flown off the handle because his two-year-old daughter had wet the bed was just sounding more and more unbelievable. One of these people that testified on Jeffrey's behalf was none other than Freddie Kassab, Colette's stepfather, who had known Jeffrey since he was about 14 years old. And after talking about what an amazing man Jeffrey was, Freddie finished up his testimony by saying if he had a different daughter, he would still want the same son-in-law. Jeffrey was also evaluated by multiple different psychiatrists who all came to relatively the same conclusion that while Jeffrey was a little bit cagey as to any issues that might have been in his and Colette's marriage, that he was normal and sane, that he likely wasn't fabricating his story about what had happened that night, and that he also likely wasn't the personality type to have been able to to commit these horrific murders. And while in part one, I did cheekily suggest that Jeffrey would have had the surgical know-how to self-inflict his own wounds and be able to stab himself in the side without making it a life-threatening wound. And to be fair, there was one medical expert that testified at the hearing that this absolutely was the case. There were multiple other experts though that said, no, it wasn't possible without risking damage to his liver and in terms and creating a life-threatening wound. Jeffrey testified at the hearing as well, telling his story about what had happened that night. And it's worth noting that he did once again call the couch the bed, just like he had when he was being interviewed by the CID. But while he had been accused of having this kind of lack of effect when talking about the horrific murders of his family, Jeffrey testified that he had only been able to sleep 
since that night with the help of sleeping pills. While on the stand, he also shot down this theory that his own defense was pushing that maybe it had in fact been Colette that had flown into a rage and murdered Kimberly and Kristen and finding out what she had done so overcome with grief and rage, Jeffrey had then in turn murdered Colette. But yeah, Jeffrey shot this right down saying that Colette loved those girls more than anything and that she never ever would have harmed them in a million years. The entire Article 32 lasted for about five weeks and then it took another six-ish weeks for the investigating officer, Colonel Warren Rock, to make his decision, which we all know by now was to dismiss all of the charges against Jeffrey. So Jeffrey was now a free man and he said to the press that he just wanted to try and move on with his life and put all of this terrible trauma behind him. So he was honorably discharged from the army in late 1970 at his own request. And from there, he went temporarily to New York before he ended up in Huntington Beach in Southern California, quite literally the other side of the country, where he started working at St. Mary's Hospital as an emergency medicine physician. And this so easily could have been where this case ended. Like it was so close. But one of the psychiatrists I mentioned earlier that examined Jeffrey mentioned in his evaluation that no, while he didn't believe that Jeffrey had murdered his family at all, he got this impression from him that Jeffrey had this intense desire to be famous or infamous if it came to it. And it turned out that this guy had hit the nail right on the head. Jeffrey had already been pretty chatty with with the press about the murders of his family. And he was also in the midst of trying to find a journalist to sell his story to. So he was already doing the rounds. But on the 15th of December, 1970, Jeffrey made the fateful decision to appear on a late night talk show called The Dick Cavett Show. And less than a year after his family had been brutally murdered, rather than using this platform as a way to bring attention to the horrors that Colette, Kimberly and Kristen had faced, or make a call to action to authorities saying, you know, we need to get out there and find these people that murdered my family. Jeffrey instead... <laughs> He sat there and cracked jokes and complained about how poorly he'd been treated by the CID and how much money he had lost during the investigation and basically just spoke about all the detrimental effects that the murders of his family had had on him. Like it was very disturbing stuff. Throughout most of the interview as well, Jeffrey had this kind of creepy half smile on his face that if you are a true crime junkie, you might actually recognize. It's often referred to as Jupiter's Delight, where the person who's lying is just having so much fun pulling the wool over people's eyes and manipulating them that they can't help but let out just a little subconscious smile to themselves, quite often at inappropriate moments, like you know, when on TV being interviewed about the brutal murders of your wife and two young daughters. And who was watching this interview but Freddie Kassab, who had quite easily been his son-in-law's most loyal and most vocal supporter up until this point. Like from the very moment it was clear that Jeffrey was the prime suspect of the CID, it was Freddie writing angry letters to the army demanding Jeffrey's release when he was being held under house arrest. And he and Mildred had spoken to the press just so many times Times declaring that they believe there was no way that Jeffrey had been the one that had murdered their daughter and granddaughters. Now, in the recent months before this interview took place, Jeffrey had already been pulling away from his in-laws, probably as part of his endeavor to move on and start afresh. You know, Jeffrey, Freddie and Mildred were all reminders to each other of everything they had lost. And while it seemed like Freddie and Mildred would have been very happy remaining close to Jeffrey and supporting each other in their grief, Jeffrey had decided that he didn't need or want them in his life as a constant reminder of Colette and the girls. So packing up and leaving town and essentially cutting off all ties was how Jeffrey repaid the loyalty of the Kassabs after they had remained so firmly on his team all of this time. But unbeknownst to Jeffrey, this distance he placed between himself and the Kassabs 
opened up room for little seeds of doubt to make their way into the back of Freddy Kassab's mind. At first, Freddy was mostly just annoyed by the army's continual hounding of Jeffrey and was perplexed as to why they weren't out there trying to find this group of hippie intruders that had really committed the murders. Because despite testifying on Jeffrey's behalf at the Article 32, Freddy hadn't been permitted to be present at the rest of the hearing because it was closed to the public. So, you know, all of that evidence found at the crime scene directly contradicting Jeffrey's version of events? Yeah, Freddy had heard none of it. So probably as a way to kind of squash these doubts that he felt creeping in, Freddy had been asking for a transcript of the Article 32 to get an idea of what was really going on. And when Jeffrey got wind of this, he reached out to Freddy after months of static and said, look, you don't need to waste your time and energy trying to sort out the case or try and find the killers because I'm already on it, Freddy. Okay, I've got this. Jeffrey then took this one step further and told Freddy that he and a bunch of his Green Beret buddies had gone out in this sort of murder squad and that they had found one of the hippie intruder murderers and that they had killed him and that during the process of carrying out this murder, Jeffrey had broken his hand. What Jeffrey didn't know was that Freddy was actually recording this phone call, partly so that he could play it back for his wife, Mildred, who of course was also anxious to know what was going on, but also partly because he was really starting to get suspicious of Jeffrey. So suspicious, in fact, that after Jeffrey told him the story about tracking down and killing one of the murderers, Freddie actually traveled to Fort Bragg and looked into the one murder that had taken place there the night that Jeffrey said that he and his buddies had gone out and killed this guy. And it didn't take him long to find find out that this murder had nothing to do with Jeffrey or Colette and the girls. Also, unfortunately for Jeffrey, while he was spinning this story to Freddie, he was already under surveillance by the CID as part of their new investigation into the murders, because while they knew they had seriously stuffed up their original investigation, they were 110% convinced that Jeffrey was guilty of murdering his family, and they were determined to not let him get away with it. So when Freddie handed on the recording of this phone call to the CID, they watched Jeffrey going to work every day at the hospital, but displaying no signs whatsoever of being injured, let alone having a broken hand. Like there was no cast, no bandage, no discomfort while performing everyday activities. And may I remind you, the man was a surgeon. Like if you're going to notice whether anyone had a broken hand, it would be a surgeon. It's going to be a little bit obvious when they go to perform surgery. Oh, hi. It's going to be obvious, right? I think Lily agrees it's a bit ridiculous. <laughs> Jeffrey freely admitted in later years that this story of him and his buddies tracking down and murdering one of the intruders was a complete lie and one that he totally regretted, but he said that he told this lie because he thought it would help Freddie and Mildred get over the deaths of Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen. So to get back on track, all of this occurred about a month or so before Freddie sat down and watched Jeffrey on the Dick Cavett show. And when he listened to Jeffrey crack jokes, like it was someone else's family that had been murdered and heard him whining about how poorly he'd been treated by the army, it was pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back. Freddie finally got his hands on the Article 32 transcript and he went through the whole thing five or six times, like with a fine tooth comb. He learned all about the evidence that had been presented against Jeffrey at the hearing. And he also learned that while on the stand, Jeffrey had confessed to being unfaithful to Colette multiple times before and during their marriage. And almost overnight, it was like these rose-colored glasses that Freddie had been looking at Jeffrey through all these years that he had known him since he was like 14 years old. They were gone. And Freddie went from being Jeffrey's ultimate supporter to his number one nemesis. Freddie and Mildred spent years hounding anyone and everyone from the army to the FBI to Congress to pick up the case. They were also very vocal in the press against Jeffrey. They filed multiple citizen complaints against him. Like they went 
to town. During this time, the CID submitted a 10,000 page report about their reinvestigation into the murders to the Department of Justice, basically saying like, yeah, we know we stuffed up, but for real, seriously, you guys need to look into this guy. And finally, in August 1974, grand jury proceedings began to determine whether Jeffrey would once again be charged with the murders of his family, nearly five years after the murders had occurred. And during this five years, Jeffrey had just been living his best life in California. He was now the director of emergency medicine at St. Mary's Hospital. He was living in a waterfront luxury condo, driving a Mercedes. He had a 40-foot yacht called The Recovery Room. He had been in a series of different relationships with different women. Like, I'm not here to judge. Everyone grieves in their own way. But Jeffrey was living in a way that was like... Colette and the girls had never even existed. But this bachelor lifestyle that Jeffrey had created for himself was rudely interrupted on the 25th of January, 1975, when just under an hour after being indicted by a grand jury in North Carolina, Jeffrey was arrested in his luxury condo in California and charged with three counts of first degree murder. At his arraignment, Jeffrey pled not guilty and he was released in less than a week on a $100,000 bail that had been raised by a group that called themselves Jeff's Friends. And this group was made up by his friends and colleagues in California. And after being released, Jeffrey just went back to work at the hospital. Again, like nothing had ever happened. And a bit of legal back and forth occurred here. Uh, the first instance of many legal back and forths in this case, where of course, Jeffrey's lawyers fought the indictment, arguing things like double jeopardy and impediment of speedy trial rights, and they initially won. The indictment was actually temporarily dismissed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in 1976, but in 1978, it was reinstated by the Supreme Court. And despite Jeffrey's lawyers putting up one hell of a fuss, this time it stuck. And so on the 16th of July, 1979, nine and a half years after the murders of Colette, Kimberly and Kristen, the trial of the United States versus Jeffrey McDonald commenced in Raleigh, North Carolina. Jeffrey was once again being defended by the very extravagant Bernie Siegel, who had defended him in the Article 32 hearing back in 1970, and also by the much milder mannered Wade Smith, who was considered one of the very top civil and criminal defense attorneys in North Carolina. These two lawyers were quite the odd couple, but it was okay. They made it work. And up against these two celebrated, intimidating, top-notch attorneys, prosecuting Jeffrey McDonald was Jim Blackburn. This was Blackburn's first murder trial, but having been at the crime scene and already thoroughly convinced that Jeffrey was guilty as sin, Blackburn said he went into this trial not as a whodunit, but with the attitude of, how the hell can I prove he did it? Blackburn was joined by Brian Murta, who also had never tried a murder case, but Murta had been present at the grand jury indictment and he heard all of the evidence against Jeffrey. And as a result, he resigned from his commission as a captain in JAG and joined the Department of Justice so that he could have a direct hand in bringing Jeffrey to trial. So seeing these two guys on the other side of the courtroom, just green as all hell, I bet Siegel and Smith just grinned at each other like Cheshire cats in anticipation of another easy win for Team Jeffrey. One of the key pieces of evidence at this trial was Jeffrey's pajama top. And we discussed already in part one how lots of the little blue fibers had been found in places that didn't line up with Jeffrey's story, including underneath Colette's body. There was even one found under Kristen's fingernail, but Blackburn and Murta used the pajama top to cast even more doubt on Jeffrey's story. I feel like I'm pronouncing Murta wrong. Murder. Murder? I don't know how else you could pronounce it. The pair performed an impromptu reenactment of the living room struggle, and Murta had the pajama top entangled over his wrists, just like Jeffrey said it had been, and he used it to try and ward off attacks from Blackburn, who was stabbing at him with an ice pick in the middle of the courtroom. It was very dramatic. 
And following this very dramatic reenactment, they pointed out two key things. Firstly, Murto had suffered a defensive wound to his arm during this short staged attack in the courtroom, whereas Jeffrey, meanwhile, had suffered no such wounds to his arms, despite the supposed attack on him taking place over a much greater period of time. And secondly, the holes in the pyjama top used in the courtroom demonstration were jagged and rough, whereas the holes in Jeffrey's pyjama top had been neat and almost perfectly round. So the indication here was that the holes in Jeffrey's pyjama top hadn't been created during a struggle while the top was in motion at all, but instead the top had been completely stationary laying over Colette's body as Jeffrey stabbed her through it to make it look like he had been attacked as well. And adding weight to this theory, a FBI expert came forward and said that Colette's blood had stained the top before it had even been torn in the first place. And then they took it even further. An FBI expert took the stand and said that when it was folded just right, the 48 holes in the pajama top lined up perfectly with the 21 ice pick stab wounds that Colette had suffered. Totally crazy, mind blown, but there are a couple of issues here. Firstly, Jeffrey said he remembered shaking the pajama top out like a towel before he laid it over Colette. So he was saying it wasn't all bunched up and folded like this expert was saying. The expert then admitted that to get the holes in the top to line up with Colette's wounds, he had had to arrange it slightly differently to how it had appeared in the crime scene photos. And he also hadn't made any allowances for how the top might have shifted during the period that Colette was being stabbed. Finally though, looking at the way the fibers were bent in the holes, like if you were stabbing from this way, the fibers would bend that way. And if you were stabbing this way, the fibers would bend that way. But when the top was folded the way it was to line up with Colette's wounds, you had fibers pointing in different directions, which didn't make any sense at all. Jeffrey also said that the courtroom demonstration looked nothing like the actual struggle that had taken place in the living room. And the defense had their own expert that came up and said that he had performed the exact same experiment in his lab with very different results. But moving on from the pajama top, there was of course, obviously the weapons that had been found at the crime scene. Jeffrey had always said he didn't recognize these weapons. So they had to have been brought into the apartment by the hippie intruders. But in reality, the knives were the only weapons that arguably weren't tied conclusively to the McDonald apartment. A girl that had babysat for Kimberly and Kristen on a regular basis said to the CID in 1970 that she had seen the Geneva Forge knife multiple times in the McDonald's kitchen. But over the years, she seemed to waver a little bit in this memory. Jeffrey, of course, said that he didn't recognize either of the knives, but he did admit that Colette may have bought the old hickory knife recently and he just hadn't noticed it yet. Now we've already established that the club absolutely did come from the McDonald residence because it had been cut from a slat under Kimberly's bed. Splinters from this club had been found in Colette's hand and all over the master bedroom, as well as in both Kimberly and Kristen's rooms. But strangely, none were found in the living room where Jeffrey said he had been struck with it about four times. And when it came to the ice pick, Jeffrey had always claimed that the family did not own an ice pick. But at the trial, multiple people testified, including Mildred Kassab and Jeffrey's own best friend, that the family absolutely did own an ice pick, that they had seen it being used in the house to break up ice and frozen food. And on top of that, they had heard Jeffrey himself refer to it, asking Colette, where is the ice pick? So listening to all of this, our favorite odd couple, the defense team, Siegel and Smith, they're Cheshire cat grins were probably fading a little bit. Like they had walked into this trial, probably expecting a really simple, straightforward win, like the Article 32 hearing nine and a half years ago. And they were slowly realizing that this wasn't the case, but they weren't too concerned yet because they knew they still had a hell of an ace up their sleeve. And that ace, of course, was Helena Stokely. Okay, we're going to take a little breather from the 1979 trial to 
really finally get to know Helena because she really is a big part of this case, maybe even bigger than Jeffrey McDonald himself. In 1970, at the time of the murders, Helena was pretty well known around Fayetteville because she tended to stick out a little bit. She definitely marched to the beat of her own drum. There were rumors floating around that she was a witch or part of a satanic cult, and she really acted up to these rumors, wearing a black cape with a red lining around town, and she even had a cat that she named Satan. Interesting girl. Helena was born on the 7th of June, 1952. She had a sister and two brothers. Her father was a lieutenant commander in the US Army, and he was quite a strict and militant man. He had been stationed in France for quite a number of years when the children were young. So Helena, being a really smart young girl who loved school, had grown up speaking fluent French. And when they went back to the US, this love of school and learning continued. She was really promising student and she was involved in a bunch of clubs and groups at school including French of course but also drama and singing. Her two younger brothers have said that she was an amazing older sister and a girl with a lot of promise but in Helena's final year of high school things started to take a bit of a turn. She got involved in a bit of a rough crowd and started taking a lot of drugs. We're talking everything from marijuana to LSD to meth and later in life she would develop quite a crippling heroin addiction. But when her parents caught her using drugs in the house, they gave her an ultimatum, basically saying ship up or ship out, and she shipped out. She was on her own and fending for herself from quite a young age. As we discussed in part one, Helena ended up becoming a drug informant to Detective Prince Beasley. And when Beasley heard about the McDonald family murders and heard about this woman who Jeffrey said had been there chanting acid is groovy and kill the pigs, his mind just immediately went to Helena, who he knew liked to wear a blonde wig and a big floppy hat, just like the woman Jeffrey had described. When Beasley then approached Helena about what she had been up to that night, while she admitted that she had been very heavily under the influence of drugs, specifically the mescaline she remembered dropping at about midnight that night, she thought that maybe there was a chance that she was at the McDonald apartment that night during the time that the murders were taking place. But when she was then interviewed by the CID, nothing of note came of it. And so the CID continued focusing their attention on Jeffrey. But if we flash forward to the following year, 19. 71, Helena was arrested for possession in Nashville, and on the way to the station, she just could not shut up about the McDonald family murders. In fact, she had spoken to a lot of different people over these months and given them the impression that she was there that night. And that's what she was telling this arresting officer on the way to the station. And despite not knowing the address or any details of the McDonald residence in 1970, Helena could all of a sudden describe that apartment to a T, right down to a rocking horse in Kristen's room. Helena also knew that Jeffrey had been sleeping on the couch and she also even offered an explanation as to why Jeffrey was barely injured when his family was so savagely murdered. She said that the group she was there with that night, the ones that had murdered Colette, Kimberly and Kristen, had hated Jeffrey with a passion and that they had been discussing retaliation against him since October of 1969, months before the murders took place. And they eventually decided that rather than then murder Jeffrey, they would, quote, kill him from the inside, forcing him to live a life without his family. So it had never been their intention to kill Jeffrey, which explained why his injuries were so insignificant. And the reason this group hated Jeffrey so much, if you'll remember from part one, all of those drug addicted soldiers stationed at Fort Bragg at the time, Jeffrey was in this really awkward position where if these soldiers were referred to him and he found out that they were addicted to drugs, Technically, he would have to report them, and as a result, these soldiers could be discharged from the army. Jeffrey also apparently didn't have the best bedside manner with these guys either. He was described as rude and abrupt, and they thought he was heartless because he wasn't keen on prescribing them methadone to help them overcome their addictions. So it's a pretty safe assumption to make that during his time at Fort Bragg, Jeffrey had managed to make one or two enemies, and Helena was 
is now claiming that this was the motivation behind the McDonald family murders. But despite her wild story and all of these details she suddenly knew about the apartment and the night the murders had taken place, when an army polygraph expert was flown in from Washington to question Helena, she suddenly said that she didn't remember being in the apartment that night at all. And then she said that she definitely did remember being in the apartment that night. But actually, no, now she didn't remember being there. And it went back and forth like this the entire exam. And this is a pattern that Helena would continue for years. Sometimes she would swear up and down that she remembered being at the apartment that night. She remembered being the blonde woman in the floppy hats chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Other times she would say that she didn't remember whether she was there or not, and yet other times she would say, no, nah, she definitely wasn't there. Now, this polygraph examiner did register deception from Helena when she said she wasn't in the apartment that night. But when he gave the CID his opinion, he basically said he thought this was because Helena really did not have a clue whether she was there that night or not. While she was being treated for hepatitis in hospital in 1970, Helena had also been diagnosed as having a schizoid personality. So, that plus all of the drugs she was taking, plus the fact that she really couldn't seem to make up her mind whether she was in the apartment that night. I mean, we could just write Helena off as a red herring at this point. That's something that the CID did multiple times during their investigation. But just hold up for a second. So Jeffrey's description of the three male intruders that night matched up with any number of vets and hippies living in the area, including Helena's boyfriend at the time, Greg Mitchell. At just 20 years old, Greg had served about three or four terms in Vietnam, and he was a pretty messed up guy. Like Helena, he was heavily addicted to drugs, and like a lot of other veterans at the time, he was very affected by his time in Vietnam. Like, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but Greg basically had no problem sharing very distressing stories about some of the atrocities he had witnessed during the war, some of which he had had a direct part in and had photographic evidence of that he was very happy to just show around. And here's where things start to get a little bit messy because on some of the occasions that Helena would turn around and say, yes, she was at the McDonald apartment that night, she would say that Greg was one of the people there with her, that he was one of these soldiers that was pissed off and seeking retaliation against Jeffrey. And Helena would say that while she had just been innocently walking around the apartment, holding a candle and chanting, acid is groovy and kill the pigs, Greg, meanwhile, had had an active role in the murders themselves. So Greg was tracked down and questioned, but he turned around and said, nah, -uh not me. I don't know what Helena's talking about. I wasn't even with her that night. And he actually passed a polygraph test in which he denied any involvement in the killings or knowing who had committed them. But as it turned out, just like Helena, Greg had spoken to many different friends and family members over the years about the murders, confessing to have taken part in them. And he just seemed truly tormented by the murders themselves. He was quoted by one friend as saying, we didn't mean to kill anyone. Things just went bad. And I am not even done. According to a woman named Anne Sutton Kennedy, in March of 1971, a young man came to stay at a house in Fayetteville that was being run by the ministry she worked for called The Manor. The Manor was essentially this outreach program that existed to help young people overcome their addictions to drugs and alcohol. So Anne said that this young man admitted himself to the program. And she said at one of the groups, meetings, he had piped up, he had shared and said that along with being addicted to drugs, he was also involved in a cult and that he had murdered people. But the very next day, they found that this man had just disappeared. Like he had stolen some clothes and money from one of the ministers that lived at the house and just run off, he'd legged it. So Anne and about six others that same afternoon took a trip to this old, like rundown abandoned farmhouse on the outskirts of Fayetteville that the manor also owned. And they were there to just do like a quick little regular security check because no one lived 
lived there, but they were in the process of doing the farmhouse up so that they could use it in a similar way to the house they had in town. And as they pulled up to the farmhouse, they saw this same man that had disappeared on them just absolutely legging it away from the house. And this really freaked them out. So they went to the gas station and called the police so that when they went back, if anything went down, the police would be there clever. So when the police arrived, they all went inside and written on one of the walls in red dripping paint were the words, I killed McDonald's wife and children. After this, when Anne was down at the police station being shown the photos of 20 odd different men, guess whose photo she picked out as being the one that she had heard confessing to murder in the group meeting and seen running away from the house where this confession had been scrawled? Yes. Greg Mitchell. Now, the police officers who had accompanied Anne and the others inside the farmhouse and had seen the confession on the wall didn't have a camera on them at the time, so they couldn't take a picture. So Anne said, don't worry, just come back tomorrow. I'll be here with a key to let you in. But when they got back the next day, someone had broken in again and covered up the words with spray paint so that you could no longer read them crazy. Back to Helena, while she had been mentioned at the Article 32 hearing in 1970, she had never personally appeared because after the murders, she had just packed up and left town and I believe they just couldn't find her. She was still a key part of the hearing though. In fact, when Colonel Rock dismissed the charges against Jeffrey, he recommended that civilian authorities look further into Helena Stokely and find out if she had anything to do with the murders. One of Helena's neighbours, a man named William Posey, testified at the Article 32 that the night of the murders at about 4am, he had gotten up to use the bathroom and he'd looked out his window and seen Helena and about two or three males pull up in a Mustang outside her house. Posey also testified that he had spoken with Helena a couple of weeks later and she had been complaining because she needed to leave town because she was being harassed by the police and she didn't have an alibi for that night. He also said that on the day of Colette and Kimberly and Kristen's funerals, Helena had sat on her front porch dressed completely in black with several funeral wreaths arranged on her front yard, something he said he found a little bit suspicious. But Posey only came forward to give this testimony after Freddie Kassab had announced that he was giving a $5,000 reward to anyone with information that led to an arrest in the murders. And after Posey failed a polygraph test in relation to his testimony, he admitted that he wasn't sure what night it was that he had seen Helena getting home at 4 a.m. And the Mustang he mentioned he had seen in a dream like months after the murders. But as we've established, Helena would still occasionally regularly say that she had been at the apartment that night. And one of the parts of her story was that while she had been there with this group, the phone had rung and she had answered it. And a man on the other end had asked for Jeffrey. And Helena, being high as a kite on mescaline as she was, thought this was just too hilarious. And she laughed and told the man that Jeffrey wasn't there. But before one of the guys shouted at her to hang up the phone. Now get this, there was a man named Jimmy Fryer who claimed that on the night of the murders at about 2 a.m., he had called the McDonald residence. And this was actually totally by accident because Jimmy had called the hospital asking for Dr. McDonald's number. But rather than giving him his doctor's number, a totally different Dr. McDonald, the hospital had accidentally given him Jeffrey's number. So Jimmy said that when he had called the McDonald apartment that night, this random girl had answered and told him that Jeffrey wasn't there, just giggling hysterically. He said he had heard a struggle going on in the background and maybe something breaking. And that the last thing he heard before the line went dead was a male voice saying, hang up the goddamn phone. So we now had someone other than Helena herself who could corroborate her story and place her squarely in the apartment that night. Back to 1979, leading up to the trial, Helena had approached Siegel and Smith saying that she would testify on Jeffrey's behalf, but only if they guaranteed her immunity. Because yes, according to her story, she was at the apartment that night, but she had taken no part in the murders themselves. And Siegel and Smith were like, yeah, nice try, but 
no. So they subpoenaed her to testify instead, giving her no guarantee of immunity whatsoever. But when Helena sat down with them the day before she was due to take the stand and they were showing her crime scene photos, she again said that she definitely remembered being in the apartment that night. Helena even told them that she had tried to ride on the rocking horse in Kristen's room, but she found that it was broken, something you couldn't tell from the pictures that they showed her. And she also said she remembered standing out in the rain after the murders just staring at all of the blood on her hands. So despite that rough start to the trial, you can kind of understand now while Siegel and Smith were not too worried. They were just sitting there like, we're sweet. Helena's going to take the stand and admit that she was there that night and say that Jeffrey is innocent. We've got this. So you can only imagine their horror when Helena took the stand and totally flaked on them. During the questioning, they showed her the same photos and asked her the same questions that they had asked her the day before, but she now denied everything. She said she had no recollection of anything she had done that night after she had dropped mescaline at midnight. And Seagal was just totally caught off guard saying, but what about the rocking horse? What about standing out in the rain and looking at the blood on your hands? And Helena just shot him down saying she had no idea what he was talking about and more interested in talking about all the crazy amount of drugs that she had been taken at the time. To make matters worse, Jimmy Fryer, the one guy that could place Helena at the crime scene that night as being the one that had answered his phone call to the McDonald residence, he couldn't be called to testify because he was in prison, serving a 10-year sentence for handing over a fraudulent check to buy some clothes about three years earlier. And during his sentencing, the judge at his trial had said that he had serious concerns concerns for Jimmy's mental state and had made recommendations to make sure that he received proper psychiatric care for any issues he might have had. To make matters worse for Seagal and Smith again, the judge, Judge Dupree, refused to let the jury hear the testimonies of multiple witnesses who had stories about Helena confessing to them over the years that she had been at the McDonald apartment that night. Dupree's reasoning was that the introduction of these testimonies would add no further value to the proceedings than what the jury had already experienced from Helena's own testimony. So you can imagine Seagal and Smith were just totally deflated. Like this was just another devastating blow to their case. Now, the argument has been made many times over the years that this decision of not letting the jury hear these witness accounts of Helena confessing to being at the apartment that night was a bad call on Judge Dupree's part. People say that the jury really should have been allowed to hear these testimonies and decide for themselves how much weight to attach to them. I mean, they knew who Helena was. They had heard her talk about her excessive drug use and they had heard her testify under oath that she had no recollection of anything she had done that night. So people feel that Dupree really should have trusted the jury to keep this in mind when listening to these witnesses say that Helena had told them that she had been at the apartment that night. It's been suggested that Judge Dupree made this call because he was heavily biased against Jeffrey from the very beginning. And fair enough. I mean, Judge Dupree's son-in-law had been involved in the original army investigation. You know, just a teensy little tiny conflict of interest happening there. Apparently during the trial when the prosecution would go to speak, Judge Dupree would be really attentive and quite visibly all ears. But when the defense would go to speak, specifically Seagal, he would lean back in his chair, he would cross his arms and sometimes apparently even looked like he was sleeping and the jury was seeing all of this. Also, not only would Judge Dupree not allow the findings of Colonel Rock from the Article 32, be submitted to be heard by the jury. You know, the findings where Jeffrey was found innocent on all charges, but also the psychiatrist evaluations where Jeffrey had been found normal and sane and not the personality type to have committed these murders. Judge Dupree wouldn't let those in either. So I totally get the argument that Judge Dupree was biased against Jeffrey because some of the decisions he made during the trial were pretty damn rough on the defense, to be honest. Anyway, Jeffrey took the stand again in his own defense in the 1979 trial, and this was a huge turning point in the case. One we will be discussing in part three, the final installment into our deep dive into the McDonald family murders. In part three, of course, we will also be discussing the ultimate outcome of this trial and a little bit more again about Helena Stokely, because 
apparently she's not done. It's like one of those annoying infomercials where they're like, but wait, there's more. And along with a whole bunch of other things like the books and TV series and movies that have been made about the case and the impact they probably had, we're going to be talking about some key pieces of evidence that I haven't even brought up yet that I feel like no one really brings up, but it's evidence I feel deserves a lot more attention. I believe Lily would like to come say bye to everyone. You know your cue so well. Aww. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and Lily, we really appreciate it as usual. I hope you're enjoying the series and that you have an amazing week and me and Lily will be counting down the hours until we see you in the next one. Bye. But I have to stay afloat It's nice, eh? Be up 